volunteers or the service providers we work with. Um, we have a really a great community here for refugee resettlement, and it's because the community welcomes them. And uh, I know that, uh, there's people I'm looking at right now that have been involved in refugee resettlement and helping refugees for years and years. Yeah, it's a great, uh, it's a great uh, initiative. It's a great mission for churches. And we learn a lot by working with refugees. They teach us a lot about ourselves, about perseverance and hope. And uh, I think it's it's a challenge working with refugees. There's language, there's cultural issues. Um, but uh, the rewards are terrific. And that's why people like Pat and Mike, myself, Karen, mm -hmm. they've been doing this for a long time. And we love doing it. So um, since I'm, I'm out of time and I have to stop talking, Karen's <laughs> getting up, I'll just stop. But uh, if you have questions <laughs> afterwards, um, I'll stick around for a bit. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you. Next speaker is Mike Boucher, who I'm going to let introduce himself. <laughs> I think most of us recognize his face from his beautiful homilies. So Karen asked that I might say a few things about trauma. Um, and uh, maybe just, to, I, I'd probably frame it under the general heading of things to think about when working with uh, refugees. Um, everything I might say could be wrong. So let's, let's just start there. Uh, <laughs> Humans are humans, and so anytime you start to describe a human interaction, just like if I were to say to you, well, here's what a family looks like, you know, and then you walk into the next family, it doesn't look anything like what the speaker just said or what the, and, you know, most refugees have not read the book on what refugees are supposed to act like. Um, so there's a diversity of human experience that would just start by saying that. And yet we, we sort of in the, the mental health field and the, the health uh, field know a lot about what happens to people when they've gone through traumatic events. Um, and when we speak of trauma, um, this could be all kinds, a whole range of human experiences. These are just uh, traumatic events are things outside of sort of the, the uh, range that we might come to expect on a daily basis. The difficulty for some folks, though, is actually trauma becomes normalized, like they're in some of the situations people are in. We know this here in the United States, for example, people living in impoverished urban communities for the most part. There's, there's constant traumatization, and it, it becomes the norm as opposed to like an event that happens once in a while. So even beginning with that thought, like there are just a lot of things, and some of the folks who, who we're going to be working with have come from very difficult parts of the world. Um, don't really know how to navigate this place. And they're put into some of the places to live that no one else wants to live in who actually knows how to navigate these places. And so there's, there's, there are multiple layers of things going on here. You know, and, and I just ask us sometimes to think through, what would it be like if, let's say, all the people of Rwanda Kuwait were just moved out? One day, you know, the police forces around here, the, the National Guard just cordoned off Rwanda Kuwait, and anyone who lived within that boundary was forced to move to Pennsylvania, these relocation programs. They just put on buses and gone. Like, and, and we say, well, I got, you know, I, my mom lived there. Where is she? No one has any information to give us. I say, well, the, these folks, they were not living here legally, so we've asked them to move. Okay? There, there'll be information <coughs> given in time. So they moved to Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania houses them for a year or two, and then they're sent to, um, I don't know, let's, let's just pick any country, Thailand. Like, imagine yourself going through these types of, of things. Now, I know it, it's hard to imagine. It's hard to know what happens. And yet, we can begin to think about what, what would be some things that are crossing our minds. And then add on top of that, if you've actually witnessed traumatic events happening, if things happen to you or your family. Um, and that, that could include imprisonment. It could include beating, uh, deprivation. I mean, all, all kinds of different, really difficult human events. So that's just kind of some, some opening thoughts on the person sitting in front of us or, or across from us. And in the back of our mind, we might be thinking, what helps people heal once they've gone through difficult events? And a lot of us could probably tell stories from our own lives of difficult events that we've been through and how we've healed or to what degree we've been able to heal. And in, in thinking uh, about refugees, there's a man who I've, I've worked with, a guy named Paul Boyle, um, who is, he's, he was a, from Scotland originally, and uh, went, spent some, he was a uh, missionary, spent some time in the Vatican, learned how to speak Arabic, and then he went to uh, live in the Sudan, where ultimately he ran refugee camps, and in, uh, in Kenya and, and other places, and now has spent his life uh, devoted to helping people heal from trauma. 
So some of what I'm going to speak about comes from Paul. Some of it comes from kind of current mental health literature, uh, which is really looking at how the brain works. Um, but we're also, what we're learning is the brain works differently in different places in the world. We, we thought every, the brain was the same. So sort of there's, you know, just like well, back in the, uh, I don't know, 40s and 50s, we assumed that male development was the norm for everyone. If we just studied college-age men, we should know all we need to know about people and their psyche. <laughs> and then in the 60s, women were like, hello. Um, <laughs> We don't operate that way, and what we're realizing now is as we study people's brains in different parts of the world, things we perceive and notice are actually different, because we're conditioned differently, so our brains respond accordingly. So there, we're trying to think about how, how different ev events uh, affect people. Um, but one of the, the key things that Paul, Paul says, and I'll, just, I'll kind of try to summarize a few pieces. One, when you're working with somebody. It's really not the best idea, if you don't know them well, to say, so what's happened to you? That launches somebody right back into, now, we might be curious. We might want to know. And it could be good for us to know. But what Paul always says is, don't ask what happened to you. Ask, as a result of what happened to you, what's going on now? Okay, which is, it's, it's a slightly different thing. But it doesn't ask somebody to recount. But see, if, you know, I'm, I'm a therapist, and uh, one of the scripts of therapy is when you go in, you're supposed to tell everything that's wrong with you. Like, if you go in and say, you know what, I'm a great, balanced, healthy, productive person. Your therapist is going to be thinking you have a personality disorder or something, because no one comes in and says that. What you say is, well, you know, I came from this kind of family, and this kind of thing happened to me, and these things. And so refugees quickly have learned. And, and there's a lot of talk about this, that in some ways they have to be sick enough to be a refugee. And yet they can't be too, like there are these balances that people have to play in order for the politics to work. Um, and so even the status of refugee, there are a lot of people who are questioning that because then sometimes people have to uh, maintain a victim role. And so we want to get away from that question of just what happened to you because that may be a really important factor in their life but they're here now. And so we want to address that and just say, so you know, how do you, based on the things you've gone through, how, how do you think that's affected you or changed you? And so that also can help us get an idea of people's coping mechanisms and just how they are today. Another thing Paul says in his own trauma research is that sometimes we only start seeing the symptoms of trauma um, six weeks to 18 months after someone feels safe. Okay? So that means things could have been happening a long time ago. And they may not have felt safe where they were. They come to the United States. Catholic family works with them for 90 days. About a year and a half later, they're in a nice routine, and suddenly their lives collapse. And I mean, this is actually uh, quite a few of the case managers have seen this in the past. Like, everything was going so well. I don't understand what happened. The person just stops showing up for work. The person goes into a deep depression. Uh, like, they start drinking. They're fighting more. They're acting out. Their marriage falls apart. And, like, we scratch our heads going, but you had everything. You had the apartment. You, you had the job. Uh, I don't get it. And so some of what we're seeing is that there are these times, like, symptomology starts to show up when part of us says, okay, we can deal with this now. And that's problematic. Uh, because our, we, in, we invest a lot of energy in refugees at the front end and then somewhere down the road. Um, and like I'm involved in a project right now that's trying to address refugee mental health because their first stop ain't the therapist. Um, that, that's not the primary way people deal with problems all around the world. You, you don't go to a counselor. Um, there are other ways of, of addressing it. So I, I just put those two things out. One. I would caution you when you're working with folks on to say, so tell me what happened to you. And you can ask questions about where people are from. You can ask about you know, their home country. Many people are incredibly willing to tell you stories. Uh, but we also have to be careful because, like Jim said, some people have grown up in refugee camps. So we have to just think about our, our questions. You know, Just like in, in my work with people who are homeless, uh, generally one of the things I'd say is, do you have uh, an address that you'd want to list? As opposed to saying, what's your address? You know, how far did you get in school versus uh, did you graduate from high school? Because we can set people up for these, like, oh, 
I didn't do that either. Oh, I don't have that. Uh, do you have a phone number you'd want to list as opposed to do you have a phone? So trying to get out of these sort of um, dichotomous choices and put things on more onto a spectrum helps people let themselves locate. So just saying, you know, how are you? How's Rochester? Those types of things. Um, and then as a result of what they've been through, kind of what, what's going on now. Um, and then symptomology, you know, we're, we're talking two things. PTSD, we hear a lot, post-traumatic stress disorder. And I don't know about you, but it seems like everybody has PTSD now. Mm -hmm. um, just like other disorders, bipolar and something like a, a, every kid has ADHD, <laughs> you know. And this was not the case 50 years ago. And is it because the behaviors are different or we're noticing it? So I think we have to be careful to label stuff too quickly. Oh, you know, you're a refugee, you must have PTSD. Um, that's not the case either. Um, most of us have PTS, post-traumatic stress. We go through something difficult, we got stress. The disorder is generally about one-tenth of a population has the disorder. And generally, that's like nightmares, um, uh, difficulty sleeping and eating, avoiding anything that reminds you of the trauma. Okay, so if that's, if that's one of the symptoms, I mean, and you ask somebody, so what happened to you? Now again, many people from other parts of the world are very kind, and they will actually answer to their own detriment. Uh, sometimes people will avoid the question, but many people are, are just, they're really respectful of other folks, and so sometimes they'll actually go down roads that they don't want to, but because they want to please the person they're working with. Uh, sometimes they will say stuff that, isn't even good for them. So, um, uh, difficulty concentrating. We found that trauma affects the brain, and so it's hard to concentrate, uh, which makes it really hard if you're trying to learn a language. Um, we found people who've gone through uh, trauma and are sort of both in, in stress or maybe in the disorder have poor decision making sometimes. Like, we, we just don't understand how they've chosen to do X, Y, or Z. Um, and sometimes it just doesn't make sense. So I, I say all that stuff not to try to categorize people, but sometimes in your work you might set up an appointment, somebody comes for three weeks, they don't come for three weeks, and then they come back as if nothing happened. You say, well, where were you? And they're like, I don't know. I had other things to do. Yeah? I think that um, another mindset for me is that they're constantly having to prove themselves and constantly under someone's thumb, you know? Like, we're free to do whatever we want. Is there ever a point that they are going to be like that unless, or is it only if they become citizens? No. Um, that probably their mindset maybe why they didn't show up. I'm so tired of being Certainly could be. Watched, you know? um, there, there are a lot of people who've gone through, you know, for example, I guess the one uh, Jim mentioned, I think the word resilience. I, I'm astounded that more of the folks who I have contact with aren't uh, having more difficulties than what they have. Um, so there was a woman named Jen who used to work at Catholic Family Center and working with the uh, Bhutanese community. I think it was the Bhutanese community. And one of the most helpful mental health interventions she did with that community was to help them get funeral services. Like, I think we have to expand. People heal when they feel comfortable. People heal when they feel safe. People heal when they have enough food to eat. People heal when they have the rituals they are accustomed to. People heal, you know, in all these types of circumstances. Uh, so you are actually engaging by tutoring, by working with someone on English, in a healing process. Because if someone can navigate this culture better, guess what happens to their stress level? It goes down a notch. When our stress level goes down, we can actually deal with what needs to be dealt with. And that's, that's psychic and physical. Yeah. Just one observation. I'm not a refugee. By any stretch. Yeah. I, I moved here from, from Holland uh, nine, eight years ago. Okay. This could be a very threatening country. <clears throat> well, some, some refugees actually say living here is harder than living where they were. Some go back because it's just too much. Mm -hmm. And there are things that if we've grown up here, we just I, we don't even know what we know sometimes uh, because it's just like the air we breathe. Uh, I, I think I got these numbers right. Uh, so Paul Boyle has worked with the Sudanese communities here. In the Sudan, the divorce rate is probably 5%. Here, it's about 90%. Because the, just the fabric that people are living within is just entirely different. Um, people who come from other religious traditions 
come here and, and don't find the same levels of um, uh, faith, let's say, in an everyday basis, or rituals that help them, help sustain them and their families. So yes, people are facing a lot of stuff, but again, a lot of the communities organize themselves very quickly around uh, a host home or two, who, like the first people who settle here, people then are all in the neighborhood as much as possible. And so you have these enclaves of a lot of, a lot of folks who then start sharing resources, they start helping each other out. One gets a job, next thing you know, 16 of them are working at, at this, this place. Um, and so there are these kind of collective ethics uh, that start happening and help people sustain themselves, even in the midst of, of real difficulties. Um, and then, of course, external inputs are needed uh, a lot of times to, to further, further that process. But what helps people heal, I think, is a, it's a great question for us to think about in our own lives. Uh, now, some of us had some very difficult problems. We never went to see a therapist. We never went to, you know, like, but we got through it. Um, and we got through it because people cared about us. We got through it because we maybe worked out and ate different foods and were, were taking care of ourselves and doing different pieces uh, of this work. And so that's, that's all part of helping people heal from what they've gone through. So that, that would be another thing, too, that I would just highlight. Just because someone comes from a refugee status, it doesn't mean they don't have PTSD. But it doesn't mean they do either. Um, we we got to remember this is a person first, and a person who is more than just the bad stuff they went through. Um, any of us, uh, if if that were our designation, you know, that's not the only thing we'd want known about us. Oh, it must have been so terrible. You know, well, I don't know. Just ask, ask broader questions, and let people <coughs> speak about different pieces of their lives. You know, some of the refugees we've dealt with. Um, just suffer tremendous, uh, I, I don't know if humiliation is the right word, but they were doctors. They were professionals. They, you know, they, they did all kinds of things in their other countries. They come here, and, or in, even in the camps, not allowed to work for 10 years. I mean, you have skills, you have passion, you, you aren't able to do something with it. <coughs> come here, you can't quite speak the language. You're reduced to work that you may not love whatsoever. Uh, but you do because you need, uh, you know, you do the work because you need money. And so what, what I see this ministry really engaged in is, is restoring hope to people in a, in a very small but profound way um, because language is crucial to almost anything else happening. Um, and uh, the young people tend to pick it up faster. And so the older folks struggle, you know, older folks like me, if I got thrown into a different context and I hadn't practiced the language, man, if I were in Thailand tomorrow, I'd be, it'd, it'd be sad uh, to try to navigate that country. Uh, so that's, I, I just wanted to say a few comments. There's, there's so much more we, we could do, you know, we could talk about the brain and what happens and uh, how, how, what are some traditional ways that, that folks have uh, moved through traumatic experiences, but I didn't want to take too much time and just kind of start there. Could you repeat what the time frame is when trauma Symptoms show so it's up. six weeks to 18 months okay. after someone feels safe. Okay, after you feel safe. Right? Yeah, okay. which is why sometimes you can go through long periods of time, actually with no symptoms, mm -hmm. and then sometimes there's a trigger, you know, and that right. that can uh, work with that that can happen in people's lives as well. Yeah. I have a question on, related to that, feeling safe. The people who say adjust well, do they stay in a certain does their behavior stay like guarded? L let me. When I came to this country, I uh, was even though I came voluntarily, it was still like a scary experience, mm -hmm. you know. And there are certain behaviors that, for me, are different from most Americans. Like, there's no social safety net here. And the fact that you can lose your health care, there just nothing always to this day influences how I behave financially. Now that works to my benefit, mm -hmm. you know, but there are certain things that Americans take for granted and they just live with the risk. To me, growing up there, it's, it's different, it always will be. Yeah, so again, each scenario is different. Uh, something that, for example, in some of the communities that, that Jim has, has worked with and helped to, to settle here, uh, they have to have extensive community meetings just to say, you know, when, when the police come to your neighborhood, that's okay. Just don't, don't run away. Mm -hmm. Because in some places, I mean, you see anyone who looks uniformed, you're, you're in the other direction because you have no idea what they're going to do. Some places, for example, in Africa uh, that 
Paul Boyle was talking about, everybody needs to bribe everyone to get stuff done. You know, and so they present money. And, and sometimes this happens in inappropriate situations. You go up to somebody and say, hey, can you help me with this? And the person's like, what, what are you doing? You know, and, and it's, well, I'm just trying to help this process out because I know if I don't do this, and it's like, that's not how it is here. You know, it's, it's all right. You can just ask for it, and it's, it's going to happen. But you know, people are, are also incredibly different. There are some folks who will come here, they've been through hard stuff, they recover, and they move on. I mean, it's no, no big deal. Uh, other people carry things uh, in, in a